Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P, Joe P. Zapia, and today we're going to take a deep dive into the running back position because every year there's a certain confluence of events where a bunch of characteristics for running backs in the NFL mean that they have an opportunity to finish as an RB1. We're going to talk about some of the players in fantasy football that fit that criteria who just might be able to make your dreams come true in fantasy. And to help me do it, of course, is Pat Fitzmorris and D-Bro Derek Brown, the king of bros. We're going to go through some of these names and gentlemen just to kind of throw this out there for you. This is the criteria. So a lot of RB1s have a lot in common over the years in fantasy. Over the last five specifically, they average somewhere around the age of 24.8 years old, which is, uh, I believe, Pat just missed this. I think he turned 25 last summer. Uh, the average years as a pro, 3.8, uh, which Derek Brown missed. Uh, you know, he's nowhere near being a professional yet. Uh, and 20% of the time, they're in their contract year, which I always find fascinating too. And typically, that can be very significant. So of the 12 RBs that produced RB1 seasons in a contract year, seven of them finished as RB1s for the first time in their career. So what we've done is we've compiled a list of eight running backs here that fit somewhere in this wheelhouse and we're going to talk about them before we get into the names though don't forget if you haven't already like this video share and subscribe to the youtube channel over on fantasy pros and click that little bell to let goes ding for notifications because we have the best fantasy football content on the planet right here at fantasy pros and gentlemen i'm going to kick things off here with travis atm he is in his third season check he is 24 years old check he plays with a competent quarterback check in an offense that is very exciting so pat fitzmorris we're going to start with you here. What are the chances of Travis Etienne, in your opinion, finishing the 2023 season as an RB1? Not the RB1, but as an RB1. So for Travis Etienne to finish in top 12, uh, as a top 12 running back scorer, I would say maybe 35%. And uh, I, I think he has the talent to do it. I like that he's playing in, a, in a, an ascendant offense tethered to an up-and-coming uh, top quarterback who just happened to be his college teammates. And um, my only concern is that, like, I still don't think we have a handle on how the Jaguars really want to use him. Because we saw him replaced at times on passing downs last year by Jamichael Hasty. Now the Jaguars have drafted Tank Bigsby, who is maybe a threat to some of ETN's early down work. So that's kind of my concern. Like, I, I just... I'm not sure how they want to use him, but I don't think they really want to use him as a workhorse. All right. Uh, Derek, when we're looking at where he is being drafted right now in the ECR, he is basically RB13. So he's right on that precipice. So the consensus believes that he can get to this point. Uh, in terms of the ADP for him, again, he is the 13th running back going off the board right after Brees Hall and before Kenneth Walker. So... You know, Pat makes some good points there about ATN and the, the percentage there he gives around 30%. That's an intriguing one. He has dealt with some injury issues. We know that. Uh, I know that you've mentioned Tanks Bigsby on this show before, but I don't want to focus on him so much. I want you to focus on Travis ATN and tell me about why you think he can or cannot finish 2023 as an RB1. I mean, that's that's exactly where I was going to start, Joe. I'm not going to do what everybody thinks I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about he who shall not be named. Mm -hmm, yeah. I, Pat already brought up his name. I won't do it here. But I, I will. I, I can't be the, the highest person on the ATN in this podcast right now. So I'm going to go with 20% that okay. this happens. And uh, is there a path for ETN as an early down rusher with that type of talent? Yes, there is from that perspective. He has the explosive measurables that we look for when targeting RB1 type of candidates. He was 14th in yards after contact per attempt and top 10 in breakaway percentage and elusive rating last year. So those things are perfectly in line for Travis Etienne to be an RB1. The problem, again, that we've talked about is issues in the passing game, issues in the red zone. And can he get the passing game utility and usage with not even, he was shown to be named, but Jermichael Hasty there, that's where I have problems with. But from an, a, a rushing talent standpoint, yeah, he's got the talent. He finished as RB 16 and half PPR last year. Uh, he had 1,125 rushing yards. 
just five touchdowns. I mean, if you add a couple more touchdowns there, eventually he gets pretty close to that precipice of an RB1, but clearly the guys aren't quite buying Travis Etienne as an RB1, so we'll see as the 2023 season unfolds. Another player that is in this mix in terms of age, he's 24, uh, fourth year in the league, so we're right in there. We're ticking that box too. And in a contract year, oh, the beloved contract year is DeAndre Swift. Now, DeAndre Swift finds himself in a new spot. He's basically in a show-me spot, really, with the Philadelphia Eagles, a team that was quite good last year at running the football. Now, he's not alone in that backfield. Kenneth Gainwell is there. Rashad Penny they brought in. That's kind of my hurdle when I look at DeAndre Swift finishing as an RB1. It's not so much the talent, so much as the health and all of the opportunities that might get taken away from all these other backs, potentially. So, Derek Brown, we'll start with you. You're the Eagle Whisperer. You've been that guy in this Eagles offense the last few seasons that really knows what's going on. Do you think that DeAndre Swift in this contract year has a big potential 2023 in store? No, I do not. And this is not from a talent standpoint again for Swift. He was 16th in yards out of contact per attempt last year, but this comes down to the makeup of this offense. And what are they going to do? Because, yeah, you talked about it, Joe. This backfield's money. Gainwell is similarly talented. Rashad Penny is a better early down talent mm -hmm. than DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift, do we really profile him to be a 15, 18 type of carry running back? No. Is he going to get that type of work in this offense? No. Is he even the goal linebacker? Or does he even have the chance to be the goal linebacker in this offense? Probably not. That goes to Jalen Hurts. So where wh what gives him that type of upside? Oh, the pass game utility. He's so good in the passing game. Oh, wait. Philly does not throw to their running backs. They were legit 32nd in the NFL in target volume and target percentage to the position last year. So... Somebody's going to have to sit here and draw me like in crayon and talk to me like I'm five about how Swift gets there because I, I don't see the path, Joe. Well, I'll send you that Crayola 64 right over to your house <laughs> there. I know you like the one with the sharpener in the back too. Pat, I think the, uh, I do. the stickiest stat there is the Eagles lack of uh, lack of throwing the ball to running backs. That to me is the one that really stands out because that's DeAndre Swift's game. That's what the Detroit Lions tried to do with him. Unfortunately, it fell short of the expectations. So do you see something here that we don't? Because I understand the narrative you can also take, which is Rashad Penny has trouble staying on the field himself. And if DeAndre Swift can and Penny can't, perhaps the calculus changes for Swift. What are your thoughts on him potentially finishing as an RB1? Yeah, I mean, you just said it, Joe. The roadmap to uh, RB1 status for DeAndre Swift would probably depend on some sort of catastrophic injury for Rashad Penny, unfortunately. Short of that, I, I just don't see it either. Um, and you mentioned the the pass catching. Uh, Debro said that, you know, the Eagles were last in running back targets and target rate last year. Uh, Swift was targeted 70 times last year in 14 games. That's five targets a game. The year before, 2021 he had 78 targets in 13 games so that was six targets a game the eagles had 61 total running back targets last year like that's you know barely i think it's not even four a game so um yeah it's just hard to see the path here it's um you know some of swift's best games have been when the lions fell into a deep hole and uh you know they were trying to come back pass heavy mode dumping off a lot the eagles just don't have that type of game script i mean they're the runaway favorites probably for the NFC. So they're not going to be in a lot of negative game scripts. They've got a mobile quarterback. We know mobile quarterbacks tend not to dump off when they can just run it themselves. Um, it just doesn't seem like a very good setup for DeAndre Swift. And I know a lot of their beat writers seem to think that Rashad Penny does have the inside track for the majority of early down work for them. All right. We can't sell you on ATN. We can't sell you on uh, this last running back DeAndre Swift. I have a better feeling about this one. So let's talk about J.K. Dobbins of the Baltimore Ravens. Dobbins, age 24, fourth year, and a contract year to boot. Now, last year he was coming off ACL surgery, um, and that was obviously difficult because then he had to go back and get another cleanup after week six. But after that, he did come back in his last five games, including the playoffs. He averaged six and a half yards per carry. He had 92 rushing yards he was averaging and 14 carries a game. I understand, Pat, that... You know, we have a new offensive coordinator, and I get that we have a lot more players to throw the football to, and that is great. That is grand. However, 
this is still going to be a run-heavy Baltimore Ravens attack, at least I believe so. If you're looking at the ADP of, of J.K. Dobbins right now, J.K. Dobbins is going, you know, somewhere in that range of 18th running back overall in half PPR. Do you think he has the upside to finish as an RB1? I think he does if he's all the way back from this injury. And, uh, you know, that's the complicating uh, factor here is that he had this multi-ligament knee tear um, with ACL, LCL, and meniscus in the 2021 preseason. Tried to come back in week three last year and just clearly was not himself, didn't look right, wasn't able to get a full workload, and they wound up shutting him down and and scoping his knee again to remove some post-surgical scar tissue. Um, But then when he came back at the end of the year, small sample size, but uh, he did look closer to the old J.K. Dobbins, a couple of two back-to-back 100-yard rushing games and a 93-yard rushing game. So we'd like to think that he is back to the guy we saw, the explosive back from Ohio State. Um, And yeah, Todd Munkin, not going to be as run heavy as Greg Roman had been when he was the Ravens offensive coordinator. But like you said, Joe, I mean, it's it's hard to see them not being uh, more run heavy than league average with Lamar Jackson, mm-hmm. at quarterback, J.K. Dobbins at running back. And we know that mobile quarterbacks help the efficiency of running backs because, you know, they're threats to run themselves and, and linebackers sort of have to honor that and, uh, you know, can't sprint towards running backs the way they normally would. They have to respect that, uh, you know, fakery in the backfield. So um like I think Dobbins has a chance. I mean I I I'm gonna have a hard time not wanting to wait for a show me season, but then uh you know there could be some FOMO there, fear of missing out. Um but mm. like Dobbins is definitely interesting and he's one of those guys like I, I would love to uh the key to the fantasy season, certain guys if you could know their stat lines ahead of time. Like Dobbins would probably be a top five guy for me in that category where, you know, I'd love to see what the end of season stats look like because he is definitely one of the more intriguing puzzle pieces for 2023. Pat's being very measured here as an assessment of J.K. Dobbins. I have a feeling that Derek is going to be less measured here when it comes to J.K. Now, I think this is a guy that can crack this 12. The top 12 overall, that makes you an RB1. Derek Brown, your thoughts on J.K. Dobbins' chances of being just that. Uh, I'm measuring Joe. I measured one giant pint of (laughs) J.K. Dobbins' hype, baby. The cup is totally full, and it's time to pour it all over this beautiful season that we have upcoming here. J.K. Dobbins, I think, is going to crush. I mean, if we're going to put percentile chances, give me 50%, 60%. I think that he is going to be fantastic this year. I have him as my RB13, and I've brought this up on previous shows. We've talked about Dobbins, but when we have seen him healthy, and yes, like right now, as we sit here, I'm projecting that he's healthy. He's had enough time off to sit here and recuperate from those injuries. We saw what he could do on basically one leg last year, and in his rookie season, he proved, and he still is one of the best pure rushers in the NFL. He was eighth in yards after contact per attempt, second in breakaway rate, and tenth of elusive rating. Now we have Monken coming to town who has fed top 10 opportunity shares to lesser talented backs than J.K. Dobbins. Yeah, damn right. J.K. Dobbins, RB1 season incoming, people. All right. As we continue to talk about this incoming, too, uh, if you're listening to fantasy football shows in June, and I know you are because I'm talking to you, uh, there's a chance you should also check out what we got going on in Betting Pros, and that includes the Daily Juice, where Matt Peralt every single day is giving you picks, giving you analysis, and he's giving it all to you in 15 minutes, which is fantastic. Everybody just wants to get in there, get the picks, and get out. Peralt's got you covered, so go check out the Daily Juice podcast wherever you get your pods. You can also check it out on our YouTube channel at Betting Pros 2. So get all your picks in 15 minutes, and then you can go ahead and make all your bets and start betting smarter, not harder. That's what Matt Peralt's doing for you on the Daily Juice. Uh, All right, let's get to another running back, gentlemen, because this next one here... We always like to target running backs and good offenses. Well, this guy is that. Uh, He is also age 24. Now, it's only his second year in the league, but this was a guy that did come on late. In fact, he came on so good late last year that he helped his team win a Super Bowl, and that's Isaiah Pacheco. And people will say, well, he doesn't catch the ball. He did have six receptions in that game against the Bengals in the AFC Championship. And 
he did show you a lot of physical toughness running the football too. He's not the biggest running back on the planet, but he certainly got a lot more physical than I think a lot of people outside of the New Jersey area that watched him play at Rutgers thought that he could be. And Pacheco kind of established himself as the more go-to guy as the season went on. Now, Jarek McKinnon's still there. He's back again. CEH is back again too. So there is a crowded situation. Derek Brown, when you look at Isaiah Pacheco, I know he ticks a couple of these boxes, but because he plays in the Chiefs, is there an opportunity for Pacheco to really emerge as the true number one in this backfield and possibly finish as an RB1 in fantasy? I have a hard time seeing it, Joe, only because, I mean, literally, I think you're not going to need one injury, but two injuries for that to happen because McKinnon's going to take passing down work. And if he goes out, CEH is going to take the passing down work because Pacheco, you talked about it. Pacheco is not good in that department. And this is this comes down to like, could he get there on early down stuff? Was he OK early downs? Yes. I mean, he was top. 30 and a lot of different efficiency metrics, but he wasn't fantastic in those marks either. This really comes down to he's not going to be on the field when they are passing the ball, and we know the Chiefs are going to be throwing the ball a ton. I mean, this guy had a 16% target per route run rate. And for everybody to give context about that number, amongst all running backs with at least 20 targets, that was fifth worst, Joe. Only Miles Sanders, Ezekiel Elliott, Kyle Juszczyk, and Travis oh, Travis Etienne were worse than that metric. So even when he's on the field, on passing downs, he's not doing anything with it. So, yeah, I mean, I'll fade Pacheco with this because really you're going to need a Damian Harris type of outlier season of rushing touchdowns like 12 to 15 and maybe enough passing down work to get there. And I just don't see it happening. I feel like you just brought that stat up just to take another shot at Travis ATN. I just feel that deep in my soul. Maybe. Now I'm rooting for Isaiah Pacheco because I love the guy. I love the story. But Pat, this is this is business here on the show, not personal. Derek would know what I'm talking about if he ever saw The Godfather, but he has no idea what I'm talking about. So I want to know to you, Pat Fitzmorris, Isaiah Pacheco, great team. We haven't seen a whole lot of CEH in his NFL career. Jarek McKinnon has been around the block more than once. Is there any chance Pacheco finishes as an RB1 in your opinion? I do think there's a chance. So from week 10 on last year, and that includes all the way through the Super Bowl, so it covers a 12-game span, he averaged 13.6 carries a game. And if he keeps up that same sort of pace projected over a 17-game schedule, that's like 225 to 230 carries for the season. So there's definitely enough uh, work if he stays healthy to get him past the 1,000-yard mark. And as Debro mentioned, like there maybe is a, a path towards the Damian Harris type, uh, Jamal Williams type freak touchdown season here because the Chiefs are a good team. They're going to score a lot of points. And if they get set up on the goal line uh, so many times, like Jamal Williams did, where he's just got 20 plus carries inside the five yard line, maybe there's a chance that Pacheco punches in 12, 13, 14 touchdowns. That's probably his easiest path because, you know, as Debra mentioned, not going to be a huge factor in the passing game, but, um, you know, like I think as far as just the pure rushing numbers, yeah, I, I could see a path. I don't think it's probable, but I think there's a chance. Uh, he is the 29th running back right now going off the board in ADP, which is kind of stunning considering the offense he plays in. And Pat and I are kind of in the same mind here where we both think there's, there's a path where you could carve it out and a narrative where Pacheco can get there. Is it likely? No, but it's possible, more possible than I think some of the other names that are going in that same vein. Uh, we'll get to some more of those names too because they fit this list. Rashad White is another name that fits this list. He's 24, he's in his second year, so a little bit younger. He is the 24th running back going off the board currently. Pat, uh, I know this is not going to be a prolific offense, so this is not the Chiefs we're dealing with here, but as of now, there really isn't another contender in this backfield. Is that all that Rashad White needs to potentially finish as an RB1? Or does he need a whole lot more? And can he get it in 23? I mean, he can get it if they don't add anyone, Joe. The question is whether they are candidates to sign Dalvin Cook, Ezekiel Elliott, Kareem Hunt, uh, even James Robinson, now that he's been released. Um, it, it, like, it's just hard to imagine Rashad White being used in a workhorse capacity. But as of now, he is far and away the best back the Buccaneers have on the roster. And um, at the very least, we know he's going to be prominently involved because he's a good pass catcher and good pass blocker. I mean, that's what 
earned him playing time and, and basically a 50 50 workload split with Leonard Fournette as a rookie that they could put him on the field and know that his pass blocking was not going to get Tom Brady creamed. Like that was a big thing for him last year. Um, but, you know, then again, you said it, Joe. I mean, this is not going to be one of the high powered offenses of the NFL with either Baker Mayfield or Kyle Trask uh, at the helm this year. So that's kind of one problem. Like Rashad White's, uh, what sort of touchdown equity he's going to have this year. And, um, you know, just the mystery of whether they bring in someone else to factor into this backfield. Derek Brown, uh, best on the roster is one thing. Good enough to be an RB1, that's a whole other one. So in your opinion, do you mm -hmm. think that there's any path for Rashad White to hit that mark? It's going to have to be with volume. Like, legit, he's going to have to get there on volume because Pat talked about the, the offensive ecosystem. My worries are, can he sustain being the early down workhorse? We know, and like Pat talked about all of his past, past game acumen, and that is all absolutely true. And with the other guys on this roster, like I get him being the best, but that, that it's an easy thing to tip over. And how many times have we made this bet of, okay, well, he's the best guy there. He's going to garner volume. The offense is going to be terrible. Like how many times is that really just absolutely run pure for us and given us an RB one type of season. It has been very, very rare. And my problems with Rashad white is he's not good as an early down back. Mm -hmm. He had the second lowest yards after contact per attempt of any running back with a hundred carries. The only guy worse than him last year was uncle Lenny. That was it. That was the only guy that was worse. Well, here, here is a so, question for you. You said volume. So I'm going to bring you the yeah. projection from fantasy pros. He is projected for 206 and a half attempts, 832 rushing Ooh. yards, four and a half touchdowns, 46 and a half receptions. That doesn't seem like enough volume to get to that pinnacle. Uh uh. No, that's not nearly enough volume. Mm -hmm. He is going to have to get over 300 combined touches. I really think even on the early downs, he's going to have to like creep up above 250. That even the targets are going to have to bump up. Like, so you put all this together. Is there a path for volume? Okay, sure. The problem is, is even the best case scenario for Rashad White, that volume path probably doesn't lead him to RB1 status. It probably leads him to low end RB2 or middle RB2 status. So I just don't think he gets there. All right, we've got four more names on the list here to talk about. And then we're going to have a little fun here on the way out of the show. So the next one on the list is Khalil Herbert. And Derek, Khalil Herbert, every time he's been asked to carry the full workload, he's been good, but he does play with a rushing quarterback, so they're not really throwing the ball to the running back position a whole lot either. He is 25, he is in his third year, he is in a run-heavy attack. The only problem, too, is, well, he's also got some company. Deonta Foreman is now there, and Roshan Johnson, in my opinion, one of the best backs in this draft. Now, I don't know how much opportunity he's going to get early, but I imagine at some point he's going to get a look in this season. So, is there any way that Khalil Herbert can somehow fend off all of these negatives and end up as an RB1? Nope. I don't see it happening. Crowded backfield, you talked about the other guys there. They are equal, if not better, running back talents on their early downs. We just talked about this with DeAndre Swift, except this is Khalil Herbert and Justin Fields is the red zone back. He is the running back that they look at when they get near the goal line a lot. And the only problem with the Herbert is he doesn't have that trump card of Swift. Mm -hmm. He's a terrible receiver. 0.62 yards per route run over his career. That's terrible. And the only other team that throws to the running backs less than Philly was Chicago. Mm. So, no, I don't see the, the RB1 path here. RB2 is the best you can hope for. That feels about right to me, Pat. Does that feel right to you? It does. Um, he, he's not going to get goal line work because the other guys in this backfield are big, powerful backs. Um, he's not going to get a lot of pass catching activity. Uh, we talked about the Eagles having only 61 targets last year. The Bears had 62. They were 31st in running back targets. So it's going to be a three-man backfield. There's just no path for Herbert. Okay, no path for Herbert. You heard it there first. Uh, the next guy there is a path for now because Dalvin Cook is not in town. Currently, Alexander Madison is the 26th running back going off the board. Now, that I anticipate changing as we get closer into the season. There's going to be a lot more hype around Madison, and a lot of people are going to look at that opportunity that he has right now as the clear, at least number one theoretically in that backfield. He does tick some of these boxes. He's 24. He's in his fifth season, and he has been in this offense 
for a while now. He has been with this team for a while now. So there should be an easy transition here for Madison. But I feel like, Pat, this is a dangerous one where we could possibly say, yes, he's got a path to an RB1, and then he falls short of it because it just becomes a very pass happy team, especially since that defense did not make a lot of good strides year over year. Your thoughts on Alexander Madison's chances of being an RB1 in fantasy? I mean, he is the lead back right now. And he, uh, as you said, Joe, like he does have, well, the Vikings could wind up being pretty pass heavy. Like that defense does not look good. Um, but Madison is going to be the lead guy. The thing is, he's never had more than 134 carries in a season. So we don't know how he's going to hold up to that. Like he's a capable three down guy. He has, could be a three down performer if they wanted him to be, but they've got some other possibilities. Uh, rookie Dwayne McBride as an early down guy, uh, Ty Chandler, second year guy with terrific speed and, and a better pass catching resume than either McBride or, uh, Kenny Wongwu who's the other kind of deep sleeper, fast guy, uh, has been used mostly on special teams. So there are some other candidates. I don't know if the Vikings are really motivated to go out and sign one of the free agents after releasing Dalvin Cook. It, it seems far-fetched that they would go and sign Ezekiel Elliott or Kareem Hunt. So this is probably the backfield they're going to have. I do think Madison is the lead guy. I just I don't see him being a workhorse. I think it's going to be some sort of committee. I think that's well put. Uh, just because you're the one doesn't make it a workhorse. Do you agree with that sentiment, Derek? Oh, I absolutely do. I think that this uh, backfield's more ambiguous than people give it credit for. Madison feels like a classic dead zone back, a guy mm. that we're expecting to inherit the the workload here. We've seen it before, but there's holes to poke in that narrative. So, but so real quick, like he's seen his yards after contact per, per attempt drop in each of the last four seasons. His yards per route run has dropped in each of the last three seasons. And all these splits that people talk about with him as a starter, and he's done great things. Do we realize that three of those five starts came against the hapless Detroit Lions, who over those stretches were legit a bottom three run defense? Mm -hmm. So while you want to point up like Madison did this versus the Lions, Okay, so what? He's the lion killer? So, like, he's the Boston Scott of Minnesota? No, thank you. Mm -mm. Mm. No. Well, I mean, in, in fairness to the Lions, they did pick it up in the second half and switch that around. Uh, another guy, and there's two more names on these lists here to go through. Javante Williams, who is coming off uh, knee surgery similar to the regard we were talking about earlier with J.K. Dobbins. So there's a lot of concern whether or not he can get back healthy in enough time to really hit this number. I think this is maybe a conversation for next year instead. He is 23. He is a third year guy. I don't want to spend too much time on him because I think the next guy really could be, but Javante Williams, Derek, real quick. Do you think there's any way that Javante can do enough in 23 to be an RB one? If he can be healthy, it, that, that is the, but he has big to be healthy week one I, then, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, I think he has to be, he has to be healthy within the first three to four weeks of the season. Okay. I'll give him that. Because the system that he is in right now with Sean Payton, just to lay this out for people, 15 years as a New Orleans Saints head coach, seven times in the top five for rushing TDs. You break that out to top 10, 11 times in 15 years, top 10 in rushing TDs, and five times top 10 in rushing yards. So is the system conducive for running back production? Yes. But Javante Williams' health is what I think holds him back. Pat, do you agree that it's the health at the end of the day, not the performance or even the system that's really going to be the biggest hurdle for Williams? Probably the biggest. I mean, the the carrot here that we're chasing is that uh, the, the lead back in a Sean Payton offense is something we want. Like that, uh, Debro mm -hmm. knows the history there, so he got that right. But yeah, so uh, Dobbins had 14 months basically to recover after having that multi-ligament tear in uh, the 2021 preseason. And he still wasn't right and had to go and take some more time off and get scoped again. I mean, for Javante to come back in week one, he'd have like an 11th month recovery because mm. he sustained the injury in October. Um, so, yeah, it's just hard to see. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he wound up on pop to start the season.
Yeah, that would be a, uh, a non-qualifier there for him for an RB1. All right, let's get to the last name. Before we do, you know, we're talking about all of these names on these lists here. It's frustrating when you have them on your bench and then they go off on a great day. And that's one thing you don't have to worry about when you play best ball over on DraftKings because you get the best of all your team all season long. And this year, best ball on DraftKings is bigger and better than ever with $10 million in guaranteed cash prizes up for grabs. So join DraftKings' biggest best ball contest today and get your first entry back into DraftKings dollars as soon as the draft is finished. So enter DraftKings Best Ball Millionaire Contest and snake draft your team for the season. And each week, you'll automatically rack up points from all of your top scorers. No ads, drops, or trades. And the teams with the most points by the end of the season will have a shot to take home $1 million in a top prize. So head to DraftKings app or sign up with the promo code FANTASYPROS on DraftKings.com and join the DraftKings $10 million Best Ball Tournament and get your first entry back in DraftKings dollars. That's code FANTASYPROS only on DraftKings. And if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER, one per customer, opt-in required with $10 entry free, bonus issued in 10 DK dollars. Age and eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com slash promotions for details. And it ends 7-14-23. The last guy on our list here that fits the criteria is one of the favorites here in the past of the show of you two gentlemen. So I can't wait for this conversation. It's Cam Akers. Cam Akers is 24. He is in the fourth year of his contract. And guess what? He's in a contract year. Ooh, check, check, check. So Pat Fitzmorris, there's a lot of need for something good to happen for the Rams. Is Cam Akers being an RB1 going to happen in 2023? I think there's a reasonable chance of it happening, Joe. And, uh, you know, he is in line to be possibly a workhorse. I mean, not a lot of competition in the Rams' backfield. Some people do see Zach Evans, the rookie, as some sort of existential threat to Cam Akers. I do not. I mean, he was a late sixth-round pick who himself lost his job last year to a freshman running back at Ole Miss. So, uh, granted, that freshman, Quinshawn Judkins, very good, but uh, not a lot of draft capital invested here. Evans, I, I don't see it happening. I mean, Akers did lead the NFL in rushing over the final six weeks of the 2022 regular season and ranked running back four in half point PPR scoring over that stretch. Also had more than 100 rushing yards in each of his last three games. Yes, it was kind of a, a weird odyssey uh, to get there to that strong finish, uh, you know, like benched in the Thursday night opener, um, kind of estranged from the team at one point in the season. But man, the finishing kick he put on very strong, and uh, it it gives me optimism that he is going to be a workhorse for the Rams this year. I do think he has a chance to get into running back one range. Well, it's interesting because Derek Cam Akers is going as the twenty second running back off the board right now. He's going <laughs> after Damian Pierce, Dalvin Cook, Miles Sanders, and there's not a lot of guys. I mean, it's funny. Right after him, then you have DeAndre Swift, Rashad White, who you guys said no. He's saying over here, Pat's saying possibly, what do you think about Cam Akers here? In terms of return on investment, if you take wide receivers early, you're looking for a guy who could finish as an RB1, can Cam Akers be that guy? Get the largest stack of post-its that you can possibly buy, right on every single one, Cam Akers no matter what, and post them around your room because it's going to happen. I have Cam Akers as my RB12 oh. in my ranks. Oh, oh, oh. I am here for it. We've already seen it, guys. We've already seen him do it. Now Matthew Stafford comes back. Cooper Cup comes back. This offensive line is going to be healthy. Let's go. Cam Akers, RB1 season. Joe, I want you to break out the crown. The king is coming back to town. RB1 season is coming. Because you've seen it. You seen it, folks. I've seen it. And you got to seen it to believe it. That's very important. Gentlemen, this has been a really good conversation. So just to recap for everybody here, we think Cam Akers has a shot. We think Pacheco, a long shot, but a fun one. J.K. Dobbins feels about right to uh, to us here, potentially, to be that guy. And the rest of them, maybe a tougher sell. But we want to hear from you. So drop the names below. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, comment below, because we want to know what you think, who you think can be an RB1 from this list or any list that you've got here that's going outside the top 12 currently in ADP on FantasyPros.com. And gentlemen, just for fun, we're talking about who could be an RB1. Who could be RB1 overall that's not named Christian McCaffrey? Derek Brown? You got any names for me who could fit that bill? 
<laughs> I'm waiting for you to just gaslight me. You did it right before we went live. It's Tony Pollard. I keep throwing the name out there. He was the RBA. Dude had less than 52% of the snaps or the opportunities last year. No Ezekiel Elliott. No, he's not coming back to Dallas. Give me the talent of Tony Pollard. All I want is 60%, 65% of the opportunities. And he is going to do that's this. That's all he wants, folks. Pat, how about for you? RB1 overall, who's got a shot at it that's not quite being ranked there yet? Oh, how about Jonathan ah. Taylor? Disappointing season last year, but uh, in 2021, he averaged 127.7 yards from scrimmage per game, and the guy scored 32 touchdowns in his first 32 NFL games. So uh, last year, injured, tried to play through it, was, wasn't was himself for a full games, but uh, even injured, he still averaged 91.3 scrimmage yards a game. Not bad. Uh, and that was with washed Matt Ryan and, and some other drags at quarterback. Now he gets Anthony Richardson, who we talked about the effect on the efficiency of running backs who play with mobile quarterbacks. It's good. I mean, let, that's going to be of great benefit to Jonathan Taylor. I think yeah, in and Shane Steichen, the offensive coordinator who did a pretty good job running the football for the Eagles last year. Last time I checked with a mobile quarterback under center. Uh, good answers, gentlemen. Uh, but the correct answer is B. John Robinson. Because Tyler Algier got a thousand plus yards last year with the Atlanta Falcons with Marcus Mariota playing quarterback. And now you're dropping in the best RB prospect on the planet into this Falcons offensive line that's pretty good at running the football. It's Bijan season. That's the season Derek Brown is looking for. So everybody, uh go out there, play some DraftKings best ball. Do it right now. Use that promo code Fantasy Pros when you do, and you can win. A part of $10 million in guaranteed prizes, $1 million for the first over in that best ball contest over at DraftKings. Again, don't forget to use that promo code Fantasy Pros, And also don't forget to subscribe to the Daily Juice podcast wherever you get your pods. Matt Peralt picking winners for you every single day. You can also watch on our YouTube channel at Betting Pros as well. And that'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on for Pat and Derek. I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids.